Good morning. We are pleased to welcome you to this special Ancient Near Eastern Studies lecture, where we are pleased to hear from Robert Alter, an Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, we are so glad to have Professor Alter here. Many of you probably heard his Maxwell Institute lecture last night on the challenges of translating the Bible. We were Glad to partner with the Maxwell Institute, the Department of Ancient Scripture, in helping sponsor Professor Alter's visit. Before I give the formal, formal uh, introduction, so to speak, let's go ahead and have a prayer. Jake, would you mind coming up and offering our prayer? Jake Murphy. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, for the opportunity that we have to be able to be here and to be intellectually enriched. Thank you so much for truth and our pursuit of it. Help us that as we go throughout this day and the rest of our lives, that we may be able to see truth through fiction and understand what really is and what is not. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As I mentioned, Robert Alter is an emeritus professor of Hebrew and comparative literature at the University of California at Berkeley. He's written widely on European novel from the 18th century to the present, on contemporary American fiction, and on modern Hebrew literature. In addition, he has written extensively on the literary aspects of the Bible. His 26 published books include two prize-winning volumes on biblical narrative and poetry, and award-winning translations of Genesis and the Five Books of Moses, of course, all of his translations have been assembled in the 2018 three-volume set on the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to get to know Professor Alter a little bit better. He's, his stated theme today is, of course, the book, The Art of Biblical Narrative. But as I was speaking with him this morning, given that many of you, not just the ancient years and study students, but others in related fields, may be going on to graduate school or into the profession, he actually promised me that he would speak a little bit about how he got into this. So hopefully that will be inspiring to a lot of you. We will go right up until the passing period at 10 till 12. He can talk briefly to a few of you afterwards. We've already had a couple books signed, but he does have a very tight schedule this afternoon. So please be respectful of that. When you see me ushering him away, just smile, okay? Let's give a warm BYU welcome to Professor Alton. Um, as you just heard, is this working okay? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm slightly surprised at the size of the group since I, I was invited to speak personally. I, I imagined a long seminar table with, with 15 or 20 students, but I, I will uh, make the best of things. Now, um, yeah, my trajectory has been a rather peculiar one, and uh, I, I want to um, draw a moral from it before I start speaking, which is uh, when you go into academic work, what you really need to do is not what people tell you you're supposed to do, but you, you have to follow your passion because following my passion led me to end up where I never imagined uh, I would uh, end up. And it's a tricky thing because, you know, you, you uh, uh, academic departments tend to like pigeonholes. So uh, let's say you're hired in an English department, and um, uh, my first job actually was uh, the English department at Columbia, um, and uh, you're, because of your dissertation, you're designated, say, as I was, an 18th century specialist. And uh, then uh, th they give you courses on Henry Fielding. At the time, I was working on a book on Henry Fielding, and you become a Fielding specialist. And you go to Fielding conferences. Fielding's a great novelist, but uh, uh, I delight in reading him. But he's 
not the be-all and end-all of literature and culture. And um, a, a few years ago, I, even though I hadn't written on Fielding in a long time, I was invited to a two-day conference uh, at an Ivy League institution on Fielding. And it was interesting. Uh, the thing that kind of dumbfounded me w was, here was this group of scholars who had spent their whole career on Henry Fielding. They knew everything about Henry Fielding. They knew his career as a judge. They, they, they knew his involvement with literary figures in 18th century London and so forth. And uh, some of you may be comfortable in pigeonholes, but uh, as I say, I, uh, uh, my own experience has been gratifying to move out of pigeonhole. So, uh, let me explain that uh, I am a literary person through and through. That is, I did a PhD at Harvard in comparative literature, and uh, I think about things in literary terms. But now I have to factor my involvement in the, the Hebrew Bible into all this. Um, for, through various reasons, which maybe I, I needn't spell out, uh, by the time I, I was 18, I had a good grasp of both modern Hebrew and uh, literary and um, biblical Hebrew. Uh, also, you, you have to know something, another layer of the language, which is rabbinic Hebrew, which I did. So, um, I was reading the Bible in Hebrew, not much in translation. I think my, my first experience of reading the Bible in translation was uh, I took a, humani a required humanities course, a kind of great books course uh, in Columbia College where I was an undergraduate, and uh, they, uh, we read uh, Genesis and maybe one other book, perhaps it was Job, I'm not sure, uh, in the King James Version. So th that was my first exposure to the Bible in translation. But anyway, there I was reading the, uh, the Bible in Hebrew and especially the narrative portions. I think I read all the way through um, uh, the, the first, the former prophets w with a, a roommate who, who also knew Hebrew quite well. So I, I was enchanted by these stories, but I couldn't figure out what was so great about them because they seemed so simple. They used so, so few words. And uh, the, from a superficial point of view, they might seem uh, rudimentary compared to a, a novel by Tolstoy or James Joyce. Or, or Flaubert, and yet they, they were clearly wonderful. So I put that in the back of my mind, and I went on to um, do this doctorate, as I said, in comparative literature, focusing mainly on the 18th to the 20th century. And that's where I imagine the future of my work would be. Um, but then a kind of Tricky thing happened. Uh, I had done, um, in the, the structure of comparative literature at Harvard, and we emulated that at Berkeley, you have one major literature, and my major literature had been English. English was my major as an undergraduate. And the two major, the two minor literatures required in the program were French and modern Hebrew. Now, French is no problem. I took uh, uh, two or three graduate seminars in French literature, and I, I read French pretty well uh, by the time I came to graduate school. The other problem, uh, the other issue was Hebrew, because at the time, not only was there nobody in Hebrew literature at, at Harvard, there still is not, but 
there was only one person on the faculty who um, know, knew Hebrew. And his field was medieval philosophy and exegesis. Which, what, I, he was a very dour person. Uh, th they sent me to see him. It was a funny experience. And he looked at me suspiciously and he said, do you really know Hebrew? And I said, yes, I really know Hebrew. He said, all right, go home, pick out a, a short Hebrew poem, and write me a three-page analysis of it in Hebrew. So I, I went home, and rather, I, I wasn't quite conscious of what I was doing. He was a, a very devout person. And I picked a poem by an early 20th century Hebrew poet whom I love, uh, uh, Saul Chernichovsky, uh, who wrote poems on pagan themes. <laughs> and this is a, a sonnet dedicated to Astarte. <laughs> so I brought it in, back to him, and he scrutinized it for five minutes, and he said, all right, I see you really know Hebrew, now don't bother me. <laughs> so th that was the extent uh, of my Hebrew training <laughs> at Harvard. Uh, but I, I, uh, so I, I was basically an autodidact in the field. You know, I sat down and I read the major writers and I, I read a couple of histories of modern Hebrew literature in Hebrew and so forth. Well, I got to Columbia, as I said, my first job, and I was still passionately interested in Hebrew. So I, I, all this is going to lead me back to the Bible, you'll see. So... I began on the side to uh, publish articles on modern Hebrew literature in various uh, American journals. I think that my senior colleagues in the English department looked askance at this, because after all, they had hired me to teach the 18th century, not this stuff. Uh, but that's what brought me to... Berkeley, which in turn eventually brought me to the Bible. Uh, Berkeley had recently established a Department of Comparative Literature, and uh, they um, wanted to represent a wide range uh, of literatures. Classical Greek and Latin were very important, Chinese, um, Russian, and they wanted somebody in modern Hebrew. Uh, there weren't very many people around in the field, and not too many people at the time who could write literate sentences in, in English. Uh, and I have to say, whatever my limitations uh, as a critic and scholar, that I write very literate sentences in English, and always have. Uh, and I enjoy writing. So um, they... Uh, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. It, it was with tenure. I didn't have tenure at Columbia and a, a substantial pay hike. And so I took it unseen. I'd never been west of Chicago. And uh, when I came out there, uh, it, it was breathing a new atmosphere. That, that is, Berkeley, as I'm sure most of you are, are aware, is a very lively campus. Uh, all kinds of intellectual crosswinds and, and students doing interesting things. And uh, it, the Ivy League schools are very hierarchical. Was that your experience? To, to, whereas uh, Berkeley is a, a very egalitarian institution. And also because I, I was in the Department of Comparative Literature, I could teach whatever I wanted to teach. And so I began teaching courses in the modern novel, which is a compelling interest of mine, and teaching courses in Hebrew, in Hebrew literature. So I, after I had been at Berkeley for about 10 years, um, I was invited to give uh, some lectures at Stanford uh, on modern literature. And uh, the person who was the resident specialist in Hebrew Bible 
asked if while I was there, I, I would give an informal talk on the Bible. And so I give a talk on a biblical narrative, and which I just kind of put together for, for the occasion. And I had this sense that that talk went over better th than my carefully prepared public lectures. So I thought, gee, uh, I think I'm beginning to get some idea of why biblical um, uh, narrative is so great. So uh, at that point, I was um, writing a regular column to three or four times a year under the rubric Jewish Life and Letters for the monthly magazine Commentary. In those years, its politics were quite different from what it became later. And um, so I, w I was always scrambling around for topics. And this was great fun because I, w I would work up a topic uh, on an area I didn't know much about, uh, and it was an education for me. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I can do this. And I called my editor at Commentary, and I said, hey, how would you guys like a piece on the need for a literary perspective on the Bible? And um, said, yeah, why not? I was a little surprised because the, the general focus is on contemporary affairs. So what I did was... I wrote, I was pretty young at the time, so I wrote about a feisty article scolding biblical scholars for wasting all their time uh, on hunting down supposed, supposed Akkadian loan words in Hebrew and not knowing how to read a story. And then um, I illustrated how you read a story by taking the story of Judah and Tamar in Genesis 28, 38. Now, uh, I'll probably, I know people in this group know their, their Hebrew Bible pretty well, but I'll remind you. Joseph has just been sold into slavery by his brothers. And then for a whole chapter, th there's this seeming interruption of the narrative, because we don't know what's happened to Joseph. He pops up in the next chapter uh, as uh, Potiphar's major domo uh, and the object of Mrs. Potiphar's lust, you, you remember. But what's going on here? Instead, we, we get a story about um, uh, Judah having three sons, and he marries the first one off to a young woman named Tamar, and bam, the son dies. So he uh, uh, then, according to the laws of Leverite marriage in Hebrew Yibum, he marries off the son to the the uh, the widow to the second wife because there are no children. Same thing happens. Uh, she seems to be a killer wife. <laughs> uh, there's actually the, the, this expression in Hebrew, it's very in modern Hebrew, uh, Isha Kabranit, uh, a burying wife. Uh, uh, so he's not going to take a chance with the third wife, so the third uh, son. So he sends her back to her father's house, which is rather shaming for a woman who's been a, a, a married woman. And she sees that she's being left to languish there. So um, you have to recall, we, we uh, maybe this doesn't sit well with us in the 21st century, that a woman's fulfillment in the ancient Israelite society was having children, and especially male children. So she decides to take things into her own hands. I mean, it, it, it's a kind of very piquant story. Uh, uh, Judah has been widowed, and uh, toward the end of the, the, the period of mourning, he, he goes to a, a, 
sheep shearing in a neighboring region, and she knows about this. So she dresses up as a roadside prostitute. We don't know exactly what the the dress was. It wasn't mini skirts, <laughs> uh, and uh, but it apparently involved veiling the face. And um, he sees her. Uh, and says quite abruptly and rudely, um, uh, 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 what is your price for my uh, uh, coming into you? And she stipulates a, a, a certain uh, number of uh, livestock. And, and Judah says, well, of course, I can't give those to you now, uh, but I'll, I'll send them to you at w when I get home. So she says, well, I need some kind of guarantee. And he gives her, her his staff and signet, which is like all your major credit cards, uh, since you use the signet to sign business documents. And then he sends a buddy back to this region, uh, and um, uh, they uh, and he says, "Oh, the, the buddy, by the way, doesn't say." Um, prostitute or whore, which is what the Hebrew says, zona. But he says, uh, where is the Kadesha who has been here? This shows you, it, it helps to know the, 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 the Bible in Hebrew. Now, a Kadesha is a, a cult prostitute. So it's a different level entirely from a, an ordinary whore, right? Uh, and uh, the the delegated friend has, is using more uh, delicate language, right? And they said, there's, been, there's, no been, there's not been any Kdesha around here. And so he, he goes home with the livestock. He hasn't been able to find the woman. Three months later, uh, Tamar discovers she's pregnant, which is what her purpose was. And w when she's um, visibly present, uh, it's announced to, to, uh, to uh, Judah that Tamar has conceived in whoredom. So he says, uh, take her out and burn her. Two, two blunt words in Hebrew. Uh, and they set up the stake uh, uh, with the fuel and carry her out. And as she's being taken to the stake, she pulls out the staff and the signet and says, I conceive by the man to whom these belong. And he's devastated. And he says, she is more in the right th th than I. And then she gives birth to twins, which actually become one of them, uh, Peretz, becomes the progenitor of the, the Davidic line. So it's a, a story with a happy end. So um, biblical scholars have always said that this story is an interpolation that it shows the patchwork quality uh, of nature uh, of um, biblical narrative. Something is stuck in from a different source that doesn't really belong. And I said to myself, uh, as a reader of literature, that's not right, because the, the whole thing is intimately connected in a variety of ways with what precedes and what follows in the Joseph story. That is, uh, Joseph's um, kidnapping and sale into slavery is uh, covered up by um, his brothers, you will you'll remember, by taking the, that, whatever it is, in the King James Version, coat of many colors, uh, ornamented tunic, and dipping it in kids' blood, and bringing the, the bloody or sending the, the bloody tunic to uh, their father.
who immediately concludes that, that of course, that Joseph has been torn up by a wild animal. Now, uh, if we move on to the Tamar story, the Judah and Tamar story, uh, we, we see a couple of things. The, it's also a story about deception, deception of a father. The uh, agency of deception is a garment. The prostitute's garb with the veil. And even the kid's blood is factored into the Judah Tamar story because it's kids that he's going to send her in payment for her sexual services. Also, uh, this story will be followed by the, the story of um, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, where we have a story of uh, sexual um, restraint and virtue following a story wh wh where uh, Judah isn't co controlling his impulses. So the whole thing clicks. And by the way, after I, I wrote this story, I discovered that, that some of it was perceived in the ancient Midrash. Uh, they were at times very good readers. So, uh, so I well, uh, I say at times, the, the, they have a didactic impulse which I, I, I don't see in the, the narratives. And they also work on, on the Midrashic assumption that the whole Hebrew Bible is one hypertext, so that a verse in Genesis can evoke a verse in Job or Psalms or Chronicles, anything. So, um, the, so I don't go along with that part of the Midrash, but they could be very good readers. <clears throat> anyway, I wrote this article intending it to be a one-off. And what happened was I got a flood of letters, and there were lots of letters to the editor as well. Uh, people seemed very enthusiastic. Uh, and even uh, the biblical scholars, either they ignored the piece or, or uh, they were less scandalized than I thought they would be. So I thought, gee, I have a couple of more ideas on biblical narrative. I'll write an, an, another article. So uh, one article led to another, to uh, then a fourth article uh, in a couple of different journals. And I, I was on my way to writing a book on biblical narrative, which has been continuously in print for uh, I think 36 years or something. Uh, now. I, I can't, re since I'm being personal, I can't resist a, uh, a kind of personal anecdote from my teaching at Berkeley. I'd never done any teaching related to the Bible at that point. Um, now, we, we had a professor of Hebrew Bible at Berkeley who was a very serious scholar. His name was Jacob Milgram who devoted his whole life to writing a 3,000-page uh, commentary on Leviticus, um, which is there in print in the, the Anchor Bible. And I think it's excessive, but it has some <laughs> interesting stuff in it. Uh, I mean, he, he was so serious about uh, Leviticus that he would send his graduate students, who acknowledged them in the commentary, to uh, butcher shops to observe how the, the meat was cut up in order to get a better understanding of the butchering of, of the animal sacrifices indicated in, in Leviticus. Well, uh, the thing about Jacob Milgram, which made us, his colleagues, a little uncomfortable, is he refused to teach anything to his graduate students except the book of Leviticus. And uh, so w one of my students of modern Hebrew literature came to me. Uh, she's a very good student who uh, has become a lifelong friend, actually. And she said, well, we understand the rationale in obliging us to do 
two semesters of um, uh, Hebrew biblical topics. But two semesters in which you do nothing but the book of Leviticus uh, and only one chapter per semester? <laughs> This must have been a strange pedagogic experience. <laughs> so my conscience smote me, as they say. I said, I'm going to do something for these students. So uh, I put together a graduate seminar on a biblical uh, narrative. And I had about a dozen students. We were reading all the texts in Hebrew. Um, uh, they, and we, we met at my house in the evenings, maybe because it was a clandestine operation. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I gave the, um, the course a fake number and course description because I didn't want Jacob Milton to think I was poaching <laughs> on his territory. So it was called Ancient and Modern Hebrew Text. We never did anything modern, and it had a different course number. Well, uh, I had a wonderful group of students, uh, uh, a few of whom have gone on to very distinguished careers, uh, and the, there was this strange sense developing in those evenings at my house that we are doing something that's pioneering. Then I said, well, that's silly. How can you do anything pioneering on the Bible when the, the uh, shelves are groaning with thousands of books in many different languages that study the, the Bible from all kinds of scholarly languages, uh, angles. Um, and then a simple answer occurred to me. I think this is probably true in, in all uh, disciplines, that the answers you get are... Um, contingent on the questions you ask. Now, I'm not saying that mainline biblical scholarship presents foolish questions. That They've really advanced our knowledge of the Bible in a variety of ways. But one question they never asked themselves was the what's going on in the Bible as literature. And uh, hence our, our, the sense of my students and I way back then in, in that first seminar that we were doing something that was pioneering. Okay, I thought that this would be the end of it. I said to them, well, after all, I'm not a Bible scholar. Uh, I got this book out of my system, and that's it. Just as I initially thought that that article was going to be a one-off. But then the, the, the book uh, was very well received, um, one of the most gratifying reviews I've gotten in my career was the, the eminent uh, literary, British literary critic, uh, um, uh, Frank Kermode, whom I had admired from afar, wrote a glowing review of it in the New York Times Book Review. Later, we got to know each other and we, came, we collaborated on, on an edited volume. So, given that reception, I thought, well why not a book on biblical poetry? <laughs> and I did that. Uh, that came out about four years after the narrative book. And uh, by that time, I was on a slippery slope down <laughs> into biblical studies. Okay, L let me say something methodological now for, for a, a, a minute. Um, as I mentioned last night, I, of course, don't forget for a minute that the Hebrew Bible is a collection of religious documents impelled by uh, a, a strong sense of spiritual purpose. When I say collection, it's, it's really, we talk about it as the good book, but it's actually not a book, it's an anthology. And it's an anthology that spans at least eight centuries. Uh, and so, as you would expect, there are different styles in it. Uh, 
also di different authors. Sometimes they complement each other. Sometimes they vehemently disagree with each other. And that's part of the excitement of the anthology, uh, I think. So, as I said, there's, there's no questioning the fact that these are religious books. But here I will repeat a couple of sentences I said last night. Uh, for reasons we can't figure out, they were gifted writers, that is, masters of prose narrative, uh, really no equal in the ancient world, and also the best of them, uh, many of the Psalms, uh, the poetry of Isaiah, the astonishing poetry of Job, th they were great poets. So they chose to uh, cast their religious vision in a highly wrought, often brilliant literary vehicle. And it's my firm conviction that if you want to see what's going on about uh, God and humankind, creation, history, the realm of uh, morality, if you want to see it in full focus, you have to tune into the literary fashioning of the, the text. Uh, now, it is, this is going to sound strange, but uh, in point of fact, I think that a literary understanding of the, the text has to precede uh, a philological analysis of the text. I don't mean that we, we shouldn't use philology. I've I, I become a big fan and a practicing philologist, especially as I got into translation. But um, you can't make assumptions without first seeing how the text is organized in literary terms. Well, in, in a way, the Judah and Tamar story and how it's actually integrated with the, the narrative around it and not an interpolation is one illustration. Let me give you an illustration from um, poetry. Uh, Proverbs 7 is a, a, a wonderful poem in which the mentor who speaks the poem warns off a young man of the dangers of a seductress. I'm sure all you young men in this room feel the same need. Um, so uh, he, he says to, to, to uh, the young man at the beginning of his speech, it's a little formal prelude, uh, you know, keep my, uh, my words, guard them like the apple of your eye. And the Hebrew for apple of the eye is ishon, okay? Uh, ishon probably means little man, uh, literally, but it's the apple of the eye. Then um, he launches on a, a, a narrative in, in which uh, the young man is out and about in the streets toward nightfall, and the seductress, who's a married woman who's... Uh, her husband is off on a business trip somewhere. Uh, in fact, when she speaks to the young man, she says he, he's uh, taken the, the bundle of silver with him. In other words, he, he's uh, taken his wallet. He's not going to be back for a while. We don't have to worry, sweetheart. Um, so she wait, she's lurking for him in the streets, okay? Uh, it, 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 the whole thing is imagined with great vividness. That, that is, she tells him that, that she's laid her bed w with imported li linen from Egypt and perfumes from Arabia, and so and also laid out a feast for him. So, uh, at the beginning, setting the scene, uh, the the, uh, the the mentor says first half of the line, 
um, uh, let me see if I re recall it in the Hebrew. Um, Ba'arov yom b'neshef erev. I'll translate it in a minute. And the second half is b'ishon laila va'afela. So the first half is uh, as uh, as day declines in uh, the evening twilight. And the second half of the line is in um, pitch black dark in darkness. Okay? Well, uh, I came across at least one eminent Bible scholar who says there's a contradiction here. If it's um, twilight, it can't be pitch black night. So the second half of the, the, the line is obviously a later interpolation. Let's delete it. Now, by deleting it, you end up with an orphaned line, the, the line that's only half a line. He didn't pay too much attention to that either. But now let's ask ourselves, what is the relation between, I won't use technical terms, between part A and part B uh, in a line of biblical poetry. Now, we know that they're supposed to parallel each other semantically. And in fact, um, there are some lines that, 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 uh, that do that. Like the, one of the first poems in the Bible in Genesis, this mystifying poem uh, uh, pronounced by a kind of victory chant, pronounced by Lemak, he says, Adda and Silla, hear my voice. That's the first half of the line. Wives of Lemak, hearken my utterance. So you see everything is exactly parallel, and even the syntax is parallel. But that's the exception rather than the rule. What I discussed in my book on biblical poetry is that the second half of the line, in most instances, is a development, an intensification, a heightening, a focusing of the first half of the line. Not only that, but it often involves a kind of miniature narrative development. That is, something happens at one point of time in the first half of the line, and then something at a later point of time in the second half of the line. Now, if you understand that that's a governing principle of biblical poetry, and that you can demonstrate it with probably several thousand lines uh, of biblical poetry, then you see not only should the second half of that line in Proverbs not be removed, but it's a perfect manifestation of biblical poetics. That, that is, you move from twilight to pitch black, and you move from, let's say, uh, a quarter to five in the evening to maybe six o'clock, when it's really dark and she can really get at him. Um, now, I have to add one other uh, uh, bit about biblical poetics here. What's the word for pitch black in, in the Hebrew here? It's ishon, which also means the apple of the eye. It has a homonym. And probably the relationship between the dark part of the eye. So it becomes a, a word for pitch black. Now, the, there is a, a general principle in both in biblical narrative and in biblical poetry, probably more in the narrative than the poetry, that when the writer moves from one segment of his text to another segment that might not be entirely related, uh, as the prelude to uh, Proverbs 7, 
is different from the narrative core of Proverbs 7. As the writer moves to, to the second segment, he stitches the two together by using a key word from segment A in a different sense for segment B. I'll, I'll give you one, one uh, other example. In um, uh, Judges 3, when Ehud, the, gorilla, the Israelite guerrilla fighter, assassinates Eglon, the king of Moab, to whom um, uh, the Israelites have been subject, um, he stabs him with a short sword. And the word for stab, the verb is taka. This, uh, unfortunately, you can't do in translation. Um, the, then he escapes through some mysterious side exit and um, uh, rallies the Israelite troops to throw off the yoke of Moab. And how does he rally them? He blows a ram's horn, a shofar. And what's the word for blowing a horn? Taka. So you see, taka, taka, stab, blow, works exactly like ishon, ishon, apple of the eye, pitch black. So if you understand the organizing literary principles of the text, that will preclude certain analytic conclusions of philology based on a kind of, I would say, an abstract idea of how a text should be put together. So, uh, I began to have a lot of fun with this, as, as you can see. And um, uh, at that point, I still had... Uh, and so, uh, oh, I should explain it since I started off by talking about my, my career, that it was the second career actually simultaneous with the first. That, that is, I didn't abandon my enthusiasm for modern literature and um, regularly taught courses uh, on uh, the modern novel in, in comparative literature at Berkeley. And... As uh, even as I got into uh, Bible translation, I wrote a book about uh, the literary canon. I wrote a book about uh, Kafka, Sholem, and Benjamin. A book about the city and, and, and the novel. So this has always remained a keen interest of mine. Um, but uh, I Bible translation was not in my purview when I started. And in fact, I, real, I came to realize a few years ago uh, that I had no clue as to how to translate the Bible when I wrote my biblical narrative uh, uh, book. How do I know this? Well, I, I did a revised vision, a, re, uh, a revised version uh, in, I think, about, about six or seven years ago, maybe eight years ago. Uh, so, of course, I had to, to reread the original carefully. I, I modified a few ideas and uh, uh, added uh, uh, some passages. Uh, but the translations I had done, the ad hoc translations, um, were... They, they didn't copy, but they followed the model of the uh, Jewish Publication Society translations, which were done in the latter decades of the 20th century, uh, especially uh, the 60s and 70s. And I was horrified by the translations, because I, I now think that all the modern translations and uh, certainly, the um, the modern uh, uh, the new uh, Jewish publications is are, are dreadful. That that the, they distort the original and don't do any kind of justice to it. So uh, 
I said, I got to change all these translations. And because by then I had started, oh, I had been involved in translation for a while. So I had, for most of the texts, I had my, my own new translation to do. So this came about through an accident. Uh, I tell the story at the beginning of this little book uh, on the art of Bible translation. Um, my, uh, an editor at Norton back in the early 90s, was, this is a while ago, when I, I was spending a visiting year at Princeton, made an appointment to come to see me. And he said, you know, we'd love to have you do a Norton critical edition. Probably many of you being students are familiar with those. They're, they're classical literary texts with an introduction, some occasional explanatory notes, and then all kinds of interesting material in the back of the book. You know, letters by the writer, contemporary, uh, contemporaneous reviews, uh, um, uh, critical essays, and so forth. So he said, we'd love you to do uh, uh, a Norton critical edition, maybe something on Kafka, because my, my book on Kafka, Benjamin Sholem, had just come out, or um, maybe something um, uh, from the Bible. So I said, hey, you, a person could do a really neat Critical Norton critical edition of the book of Genesis because there are many good things now to put in the back of the book. The problem is uh, uh, there's something wrong with all those uh, translations and if I were to do this, I would have to do my own translation. I was not careful what I was saying. Uh, unlike the warnings in the book of Proverbs, they should always guard your lips. <laughs> so... Uh, after some negotiation, it ended up being a straight-out translation, uh, which I didn't think w would work, because I thought that my aspiration to get a lot of the literary power of the Hebrew into English couldn't be done because of the differences between the two languages. It was a lot better approximation uh, of what I had set out to do than I thought it would be. Um, and... Um, it was very well received, so I did another book and another book. And finally, uh, as Aaron says in explaining the golden <laughs> calf to, to Moses, they gave me their jewelry, and out came this calf. <laughs> <laughs> so out came this translation of, of the Bible, and I, I feel good about it. Well, I've gone on for quite a while. Maybe I'll, I will cease and desist now. Thank you.